Hello and welcome to this new episode of Social Europe Talk on international corporate tax reform. My name is Stefan Talofer and I'm the policy officer for economic and social affairs at the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung EU office, which is supporting this episode today. Let me briefly introduce our talk, which does, of course, not go without mentioning last night's breaking news from the OECD with 130 countries agreeing to join the latest proposals of the G7. So it's the right moment to discuss international corporate tax and where we stand today. Well, despite this apparent push in the debate, we are still coming a very long way of slow and cumbersome discussions over the last 10 years with little progress on the core issues of corporate tax reform. Today, with the COVID-19 crisis, there is an increased awareness of both the public and the governments about the urgency for reforming the broken tax system for more justice um, and for creating revenue that is most needed for recovery. So I think this creates indeed a window of opportunity to push forward these reforms. However, for assessing the proposals on the table and discussing the way forward, we are confronted with this huge complexity of international corporate tax matters. And I think the sheer number of company tax lawyers out there optimizing company taxes just speaks for itself in that sense. With our conversation now, we would like to contribute to some more clarity, helping to judge which reforms really will make a difference for creating revenue and for increasing tax justice also between North and South. To do so, I have the pleasure of announcing a panel of excellent speakers, and I'm handing this over now to Robin Wilson, Acting Editor-in-Chief of Social Europe, who put up this panel. He will present our speakers and guide us through this interesting conversation. Thank you, Robin, and to our speakers for being with us, and thank you to our audience for joining. Enjoy this debate, and over to you, Robin. Thank you, Stefan, uh, for your introduction. And um, as uh, Stefan said, we are meeting today in the wake of the G Summit and the OECD meeting uh, just uh, yesterday. And we're also meeting in the run up uh, to the G20 finance ministers um, late next week. Um, so, this is a very timely discussion, as uh, Stefan said, on our panel. Uh, comprises Evelyn Oregner, MEP, who has played a leading role in the European Parliament on uh, business taxation. Professor Jayati Ghosh, who is a member of the Independent Commission on the Reform of International Corporate uh, Taxation. And Alex Cobham, who is Chief Executive of the Tax Justice uh, Network. And a welcome to you all. Thank you. Can I start with you, um, Evelyn? The G7 summit, um, which has been echoed by the OECD, as Stefan says, agreed a position in favor of some reallocation of multinationals' profits to countries where they do business and to a minimum global tax rate of 15%. How would you assess that? Excellent, good afternoon. This is a good moment to talk about uh, corporate taxes. This is a positive moment. And I just don't hide to say, uh, like the big historian Timothy Snyder said, never underestimate an idea. There comes a day when uh, uh, we can put in what we are working on already for so many years on tax justice. So this decision right now by the G7, followed right now what was uh, indicated by the G20 is really great news. Background, it is for decades already that multinationals are more or less doing what they want to do. So somehow doing their own rules. It's high time that 
those nas national authorities, member states, governments who are elected democratically, democratically are getting back the power to regulate. 50% of, uh, when you just look at the GDPs uh, uh, within the European Union, and I'm sure worldwide they won't be not so much uh, different, 50% of the taxes are paid by workers, are paid by those paying uh, the social insurances, uh, even more than when you're just uh, adding the value added the tax and only 7% comes from the corporate. So it's a big, big situation of injustice. And therefore it's high time what is happening right now to go for a minimum tax rate. Of course, we are fighting for more in the European Union to go for this effective minimum tax rate that should be even higher, but simply to speed it out already is absolutely important. There are far more things uh, to be said, but I'll just continue. It's a great sign as an introductory remark with the debate on the future of Europe. We have to go further because of having tax havens within the European Union, we should get rid of the unanimity on tax questions because there where we had progress, it was always on reporting where there is really the uh, real democratic procedure within the European Union. So we should go for this uh, abolition of the unanimity in tax uh, questions. So some for further way to go. As an introductory remark, simply it's good news and we build on that and fight for more. Also to not only implement at minimum, not at maximum, the minimum 15%, but also head for wealth. All in all, we should capture more or less everything. I mean, when we always have the loopholes and the money that is pushed away, so no co company should escape, no digital uh, whatever entity and no wealth construction, uh, uh, however it is called in uh, company law, whatever it turns. Well, thanks, Stefan. And I want to come back to those two points about digital taxation and wealth taxation later, because they're also important points. Can I uh, turn to you, Alex? Um, uh, the Tax Justice Network has estimated that US multinationals alone cause the European Union to lose a 25 billion euro in corporate taxes annually. And I want to ask you about the point that Evelyn's already raised, which is the suggested minimum rate, because Gabriel Zuckman, the director of the EU Tax Observatory, has calculated that um, a minimum tax rate of uh, Fifteen percent would raise an additional fifty billion euro annually in the European Union, uh, but a twenty-five percent uh, rate would raise that to uh, one hundred and seventy billion. As somebody who's been campaigning in this area for some time, where do you stand on that ladder of ambition, so to speak? Well, uh, just in terms of the rate, um, I think it's clear that anything as low as fifteen does a lot more for high income countries that tend to have rates of 20 or in the low 20s of percent than it does for some lower income countries that may have rates of 25 or even a little over 30 percent so the incentive to shift profits out of lower income countries will remain very large um, and in a in a, a way that makes the inequalities that already exist worse and that's kind of the problem with this whole reform you know there's been a bit of an argument in the tax justice space about is this a historic uh, event or is this deeply unequal and of course the answer is it's it's both you know on the one hand the type of revenues that you'd raise from even a 15 percent rate you know we think actually rather higher than the oecd perhaps 275 billion dollars a year um, and that's the biggest shift for 100 years without doubt since the league of nations were setting these rules but at the same time we think the G7 countries alone, who are about 10% of the world's population, would get more than 60% of those additional revenues. So the countries that lose the most from profit shifting, that's lower income countries, lose the biggest share of their current tax revenues, will get least from this deal. 
So it's a big step. And the narrative shift, the idea of, of you know, having a US Treasury Secretary talk openly about ending the race to the bottom, that is very important. But we can't stop there. This has to be delivered in a way that gives benefits to countries at all income levels and recognises, you know, as, as Evelyn has mentioned, that the OECD itself um, is made up of uh, many of the countries that are the, the biggest corporate tax havens and it's their multinationals who are doing the profit shifting. We can't expect, I think, the OECD to provide the full solution to this. And at some point, this is going to have to move to the United Nations if we, if we really want to see full progress. Uh, yes, Charles, I wanted to bring you in for a global south perspective on um, all of this. The um, IMF's uh, Fiscal Affairs Department estimates that annual total corporate tax losses associated with profit shifting, to which um, Alex has referred, amount to more than $500 billion, with around $200 billion of that a drain on developing uh, countries. Um, given the devastating impact of the pandemic on your native India and the more limited capacity of developing countries to raise revenue to supply public goods, how does the drift of these discussions then look to you? You know, I think from the perspective of developing countries, this has been really a deeply disappointing set of meetings. Uh, both G7 and the, the lead, most recent OECD meeting. Essentially, because yes, the principle that has been adopted is very important, but let's face it, that principle has been around in the air for now six years. The OECD has recognized it itself in its uh, inclusive framework initiative for basic erosion and profit shifting. Unfortunately, the way in which the discussions have panned out, there are so many limits, constraints, and conditionalities imposed on even recognizing the principle that it is almost going to be a situation where several maybe the majority of developing countries could actually lose out rather than gain so in terms of pillar two the minimum tax as alex pointed out this is actually lower than the average tax rate it's which is between 25 and 30 percent in the developing world and there's a real danger that the minimum becomes the maximum and so, in fact, developing countries are then forced to reduce this because of continued profit shifting. And also, the big concern for developing countries was really pillar one, which is to say preventing this ability of big companies and multinationals to move their profits across jurisdictions in order to minimize their own tax uh, requirements. This has really not changed. The uh, uh, the proposals that were on the table, including from G24, were for at least a minimum 30% uh, of the available taxes of multinationals to be considered for redistribution among all countries on the basis of a formula based on sales, employment, and assets, which is a very reasonable and just principle. At least 30, 30 to 50% of the global profits should be shared according to that was the idea. What have we got instead? That only the top multinationals will be taxed, only those earning more than 10% profit. Why? Which country in the world does that? That says we will only tax companies that earn more than 10% of their profits? No one does that. Suddenly, internationally, you have done this requirement that it's only going to be the companies that get more than 10% rate of profit and that it will be between 20 and 30% that will be globally shared. The amount you get is pitiful. It's about five to $10 billion, which is you know, not even one tenth, as you mentioned, of the IMF estimates of the tax revenues lost. Developing countries will get nothing. They will not even get a crumb from that table, mostly. And for that, they are being asked, according to the latest OECD proposal, to submit to arbitration proceedings and give up unilateral tax rate, taxation rights. That's a huge loss of sovereignty. That's a huge loss of their own domestic fiscal space, which they're being asked to give up for almost nothing in return. So it's not surprising that a number of developing countries like Nigeria, I believe uh, Sri Lanka and a bunch of others have refused to sign this, Kenya and so on, uh, because Peru, because they are not going to gain. And I think the others who signed also did so under duress. 
I think it's unfortunate. It reflects the continuing imbalance in power relations between developed and developing countries. But ultimately, it reflect, reflects the continuing global power imbalance between multinationals who have very strong lobbying power and everybody else in the world. Because let's face it, citizens across the world are going to lose out from this. It's not just developing countries. So the fact that this continued lobbying power can continue to dominate over the obvious need to raise taxation at a time of such critical global challenges facing humanity, uh, I think that's really telling. And it means that we really have to have a much stronger, broader people's mobilization to overcome this. So, Jayati, just to clarify, you're saying that there are uh, two problems here from your point of view. The first one is the suggestion under so-called Pillar 1, as the OECD describes it, that um, um, companies would only pay further tax beyond 10% uh, and at a 20 to 30% rate. But also there's a problem you're saying about the allocation formula, that uh, the way that any such extra money should be allocated would be a different formula based on actual activity in, in the developing countries. Um, and it would be more favorable to the developing world than the one that is on the table. Is that what you're saying? That's right. Well, on the first issue, it's not that, you know, all taxes above 10%, only companies yeah. that are earning above 10% will be taxed. That's only about 100 companies globally. And, you know, I'm sure they have creative accountants who can make sure they don't get 10%. I mean, Amazon, for example, would fall below that. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> now, I want to come back to Evelyn, because there's a point that you made, um, Evelyn, which I don't want us to lose. And that's also mentioned by Alex. That's the one about tax havens, because obviously another problem in this whole context has been the way that tax havens have operated as a drain on, on taxation. Um, and I wanted you to elaborate on that and partly to ask a question about Brexit in that context, uh, because obviously a lot of the tax havens that have developed over the years have been uh, former British colonies or dominions. And I wonder whether Brexit compounds this problem in terms of trying to deal uh, with those uh, uh, secrecy jurisdictions which uh, come within the British uh, sphere of influence. But more generally, your thoughts on tax havens and how to deal with them would be good. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, we have to look very carefully at what's happening right now in the UK. I mean, also uh, concerning uh, the outcome of the G7, uh, G20, where we just look at the exclusion of financial markets. So somehow we have yeah. to be very careful on what will, what will happen there, how it will be implemented. Uh, if, as already indicated, and somehow it was already uh, said by, uh, by, uh, by the UK Prime Minister Johnson, he was already saying, look, we'll do something and uh, make some new free courts and all that. So we'll be very careful in what really will happen uh, and uh, do the utmost in order to, uh, to control it and, uh, and to react on that as uh, European Union. I mean, what we what we learned is in all these uh, Panama Papers and LuxLeaks and SwissLeaks and whatever all these tax scandal uh, scandals is. I mean, uh, we shouldn't only have this stupid system of the sorry that I say that with the blacklists, gray lists, and so on. We should have a, a system that doesn't allow it at all. That we always look if we have to put somebody in there, but that it's but it is not feasible at all. And therefore, again, I'm very grateful of what you said right now, uh, Jayati. Uh, it's very important that we know far more also on the, what does that mean with all those countries who are not those uh, big ones who could control everything? What does that mean right now on you? And then we have to go uh, far, far uh, further uh, in that. Uh, because you're suffering at the end of the day. So concerning all those tax havens, point one, uh, we in the European Union, we have to look on uh, how, how, how is it at home? How is it in the European Union itself? So somehow uh, when we have a, a blacklist 
And then even a gray list where we say, oh, okay, there are these countries in there. And then they just look uh, who is there. Okay, Australia, Turkey, and the gray list. Okay, let's look. Uh, and then uh, we just look what is in Luxembourg, what is in Malta, what is in Ireland, what is, it, what is in the Netherlands, what is in Cyprus. I mean, we could go on like that. We just have to stop that. Therefore, we're saying that in the beginning, a lot to do at home. And therefore, I really can say, though I would have loved that we have the full disaggregation of data in the whole world in the public country to country reporting, it's already a great step that we have it within the European Union because then we can say that more than 80% of the profits shifted from the multinationals are shifted within our own our own tax havens that are existing and that we have the control of it. And therefore, I wish so much, and I'm in close contact with US senators and congressmen and congresswomen, that there is something also going on in the US. So I know how difficult and almost impossible that whole thing is, because this also has an impact on all developing, uh, de developing countries and all those countries who are not in this favorable position. We have to work here closely together to simply to sum up the system we created with the blacklist and the whole thing is a system that is the second and third and whatever best solution we should come out of that, get, get, out, get rid of that in order to have a full system of transparency that all member states know exactly where there is a multinational, where there is really a big one, how much taxes are paid within this country, how many people are working there, how uh, uh, how are those uh, most important uh, uh, economic data are looking like. And therefore, again, I sum up with tax havens, with the outcome right now of, uh, of the G, uh, G7 and right now <laughs> with G20. These are victories. I don't want to say uh, it's, it's nothing. These are first, second, third steps we are, it's a process. We are starting a process, a shift of the way of thinking. I never will hear again that is something good to have competent, a competition on taxes between countries and that it's nice when you say, ah, oh, I'm a country that has lower taxes than the next country. It's, uh, it, it, it's destroying the whole uh, world, not only economy, but also democracies. So uh, therefore it is a good thing, this step-by-step -step thing, but we of course should go further. Thanks, um, Evelyn. I wanted to, to ask you, Alex, specifically, uh, again, Evelyn mentioned it earlier, that within the debate about corporate taxation, about digital companies, they have come into the, spotlight because their network effects have allowed them to uh, rapidly achieve global monopoly status and therefore attract extract rather huge rents uh, for their shareholders. So some have argued and it's being considered or uh, has been adopted in Austria, Brazil, France, the UK, Italy, India, Indonesia, Spain, and Turkey. They will consider the idea of, of some kind of special digital taxation. What's What's the the view you would take uh, from the tax reform network uh, as to what should be done in that regard? Well, this, this goes right to a point Jayati raised. You know, a lot of countries have um, digital services taxes, digital sales taxes, DSTs in place, and they are being required in this OECD reform to remove them. And effectively, what that's doing is saying, you have to take this off the table this this tool which brings in a known amount of revenue from these major tech companies in exchange for the possibility that if there is actually a global treaty on pillar one you may at some future point get some share of some bit of the revenues of some of these companies but you may not who knows and you know we're, we're asking that you know you have the us apparently threatening trade sanctions um even in the middle of these negotiations on countries that are resistant to that idea of taking their DSTs off the table before they even know what they'd uh, what they'd get in exchange, which seems, in a sense, something that you would be less surprised to hear uh, the Trump administration doing. I think some people have been quite shocked to see that um, mm -hmm. that approach continuing under under Biden. I guess the broader point is is this one: we don't actually think DSTs are terribly good taxes. Um, you know, the the big tech companies behave not in a 
qualitatively different way from other big multinationals. They're just somewhat more extreme. It is easier for them to shift their intellectual property to use um, to make sales without physical presence. But the underlying issues are the same. It's a question of degree. The pharma companies, uh, major banks, you know, pretty much every sector is able to do this in different ways. You know, Shell to take a you know a large commodity company that's very old, you know, has a huge amount of profit um, in the last country by country reporting it published going through Bermuda with three employees. It's not that they found a lot of oil in uh, in Bermuda, you know. So th these are um, structural issues to do with the international tax rules not being fit for purpose that allow you to put profit in completely different places from where you're acting. Is. And, you know, again, as Shahati said, what we really need for that is something like the G24 proposal um, that the OECD has, has roundly ignored that would align most of the profits of most multinationals with the location of their actual sales and employment and perhaps tangible assets until we get to that kind of reform then what pillar one is doing is is very small, not very just, and, and really isn't solving the problem, even if a couple of tech companies end up paying just a, a little bit more in a few places. What you're saying, if I understand you correctly, Alex, is that in an ideal world, actually, we wouldn't be particularly focusing on the tech companies, but we would be treating all companies much more seriously in terms of corporate taxation on the same basis as each other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, the, the tech companies illustrate how the rules are unfit for purpose. And that's not surprising because they were created in the 1920s and 30s when multinational companies were really, you know, something that operated in the imperial capital and a couple of colonies. We're now talking about a different world and we need different rules. And those rules would be, you know, a unitary approach that says, multinationals don't make their profits within the individual subsidiaries they make them at the global level that's where they maximize so we need to apportion that profit according to where the sales are where the employment is and then tax it there so that you know what pillar one should have done and the original ambition was was a comprehensive um, apportionment of that sort to make profit shifting much harder back that with a, a fair pillar two to make profit shifting much less attractive because you have to pay a, a decent minimum rate everywhere and you'd really have solved the problem as it is they've done a very very partial pillar one that's you know almost negligible for a lot of countries and a pillar two that's deeply unfair and at a low rate there's still such a long way to go in so Jared, if you would um to be this isn't going to happen, but if you were to be taking the chair at the uh, the meeting uh, next week of the G20 finance ministers and setting the agenda, um, just imagine for a moment that ideal world uh, for you. What what would you be uh, trying to do? How would you be trying to steer the conversation around that table? Well, uh, <laughs> I think first all a significant increase in the minimum tax rate. I, Evelyn already pointed to the fact. So let me also, I just want to take up something that Evelyn said, and I completely agree with her, that yes, there is progress. There's no doubt. There are some significant areas, the recognition of the principle of a minimum tax rate, the recognition of the need for allocation of profits across different tax jurisdictions globally. Uh, these are both very, very important principles. And in addition, we've got significant increases in country by country reporting, which is very, very important, certainly in Europe, but more and more countries should be adopting it. And there is progress in that regard. And there is the development of national asset registers, which is going to be very important when we're thinking about wealth taxation. So the, all of these, definitely they are progress. The problem is though that a lot of this progress could be undermined by the way in which new rules are put in place. So why are we concerned? First, of course, we do want an urgent and quick deal because the problems are urgent and because the need to generate more tax revenue, especially in the developing world, it's so vast and it's so critical that we want a quick resolution. But at the same time, we don't want a resolution that locks into place rules that actually prevent developing countries from being able to exercise their correct and you know, valid fiscal powers. And as Alex has pointed out, this is really one of the things that could happen if you put in place rules that are fundamentally unjust and really do not deliver much in terms of additional taxation. So I think one critical thing that would, should be on the table is to go back to the original proposal that we are looking at all multinationals. 
we are looking at all profits, not a so-called residual profit, which does not exist in any tax system in the world nationally. So we would take both the idea of residual profits and the idea of only certain multinationals off the table. We will then apply a formula which is on sales, employment, and assets, all three, rather than simply uh, sales, which is the current thing that is being done, which gives a huge privilege to the advanced economies. And we would look for the simplest possible rules. Because, you know, complexity is the enemy of justice, as we know. And uh, I keep being reminded, there was a wonderful cartoon in the New Yorker when, uh, after the global financial crisis, when the Dodd-Frank Act was passed. And it was these two lawyers poring over this enormous book. And they're saying, oh, these new rules are going to completely transform the way we get around them. <laughs> and that's really what's happening. You are creating such a set of complex rules that it's going to be relatively easy for multinational companies, including the big ones who all have very aggressive, what they call tax planning desks with several thousand employees, lawyers, et cetera, working on ways to get around it, to be able to get around it. Uh, so I think it's no, it's no surprise that a lot of multinational companies have welcomed these uh, measures. And I think that should be adequate warning to us about what exactly is coming out of the current process of negotiation. So if I had to be in, in this incredible and impossible world where you know we would be in a position to influence G20 discussions, I would say all of the things I've said and also that these discussions should move to the UN, which is the correct global forum and which has a tax committee that could do it. It's of course probably also the case, um, Jayati, that were you to be in the chair at the G20 finance ministers, you would probably find relatively few women around the table <laughs> apart from yourself. Uh, you talked about the need for simplicity, Jayati. Is that also an issue in terms of public understanding um, of what's at stake here and a sense around the world of being part of the same debate and of the same rules applying to everybody? Is that part of what you're getting at as well? Absolutely. You know, when I try and talk to in fact, even other economists who don't deal with fiscal and tax issues. And I say, pillar one, pillar two, a residual profit, you know, uh, they don't know what's going on. And it's impossible for the ordinary person to really understand how exactly they're being conned. So I do believe that simplicity is absolutely critical in this. Yes. Evan, I wanted to come back to you about wealth. Obviously, wealth isn't the same as, as uh, corporate uh, profit, but of course, there are uh, connections, um, uh, for example, in the huge wealth gain that um, Jeff Bezos of Amazon has made in recent times associated with the uh, pandemic. And you did mention uh, wealth taxation. And in 2019, the world's 2,153 billionaires had more wealth than the purest 4.6 billion of the world's population. So how can we address that issue? Um, because also, as with, as with the question of corporate taxation, there are many ways that individual wealthy wealth owners have been able uh, to uh, put their money in other places, such as uh, tax havens, and to avoid being properly taxed on their very substantial assets. So what kind of changes would you want to see in that area? Wealth tax. So we have to talk uh, again on the FTT. It seems like uh, when we're mentioning so the word transactions FTT, tax. yeah, the financial transaction tax. Somehow, when you mention that, some uh, everybody is saying, "Oh no, this is this sell me," or uh, "This is this thing that is in the deep freezer is not waking up." But uh, when you just uh, give an, an analysis, this is exactly the instrument we need. Uh, when we tax in German, the word is very nice, Steuer. That means uh, steering. you're steering. steering means yeah. You're steering an economy. So it's, it's about distribution, it's about uh, justice, but it's about also steering a society. What do we, what is, what is good, what is not good? So somehow to, 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 to direct and uh, really to steer in the best uh, meaning of the world word and therefore I really uh, 
uh, uh, see a necessity for a real financial transaction tax because I say a real because the word has been abused, I would say, in a sense that uh, it has been also used in a context where you just have this Mickey Mouse uh, version coming up and really to talk about wealth. I just mentioned one example because uh, I see there is also Friedrich Ebert Stiftung uh, in it. I'm very much, uh, not very much, I was and I am in contact with the so-called family undertakings in Germany, in France. What is that? That's not the small, nice bakeries around the corner. That's really the real wealthy ones that say, we don't even have to talk to investors because when you talk to investors, sometimes you think, okay, they also want transparency. They want to know where their investments are going, uh, how, the, how, how the money is really, uh, more or less invested and then you see no those family undertakings they are so wealthy their spirit is I don't have to think of the employees I don't have to think of the consumers and those somehow who are dealing with this what they are uh, directing the money there is this way of thinking I own it and I have the right to do whatever I want to do and not even not even to respect rules because they are creating the rules and when you're talking about those, you see there is the, the there is the real wealth, and that's not in the newspapers, that's sort of behind. And then you just look at the figures. This is really more or less shaping the world. Therefore, I see this necessity to go for the for the real minimum corporate tax rates, and I said before, also for wealth. And we have to, I don't see anything. Now yeah, we have to go for that in the European Parliament, in the European institutions, though we have this big uh, uh, threshold uh, with the necessity of the unanimity. And of course, I see when I just mentioned Germany right now, those really wealthy ones, of course, they can put a huge pressure also on a government because why sometimes we have so much resistance of governments? It's simply because where the, where the money goes, there is the political pressure. Uh, therefore, I regard the European Parliament as an excellent place to push all that to be outspoken as much as possible, because again, we are living in times where we are uh, confronted with uh, societies that are also don't, I mean, they're also beyond democracy. So it's about more than talking about money and wealth. It's also talking about how a society should look like, and therefore we go for wealth taxes uh, to accompany the uh, minimum corporates, uh, the effective minimum corporate tax rate necessity. necessity. So if I understand you correctly, uh, Elvin, you're saying that uh, wealth taxation is not only important in uh, the revenue you gain, but it's an important as a democratic assertion, if you like, uh, a statement about the society you want to live in. Is that part of what you're saying, yes? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, you've mentioned that the German word for tax is store. I'm going to mention now that the German word for debt is Schult. And of course, that's uh, been a big issue in Germany over recent years because it also means shame um, in, uh, in uh, Germany. Uh, and I wanted to say that to bring in Jayati again because um, you mentioned earlier. No, I Jayati. think Alex, Alex had a, a point he wanted to make, I think. No, didn't I'm you certainly, going, hand, I'm certainly going to come back to us. I didn't see his hand. Um, uh, but no, I wanted to bring you in on, on the issue of debt, specifically Jayati, because um, in terms of the urgency of this, you as an economist have written about the um, uh, very severe debt crisis, which threatens much of the global south, uh, exacerbated by the pandemic. And I wondered, wondered perhaps if you could explain that to uh, non-experts who might not be aware that that is a, a kind of wave that is coming ahead, um, which you think is uh, very worrying. And of course, which you would hope proper uh, corporate tax reform and other means would provide revenues to redress as well as debt forgiveness and so on. Sure. So, you know, many developing countries are still paying more out in debt service than they are in fact in health during the pandemic or in a whole range of the essentials. Many developing countries simply do not have 
the ability to spend more on the minimum things that people in the advanced world take for granted, like you know, the basic social security, protection, insurance for unemployment, and or even you know the increase in essential facilities that you need to uh, make sure that education continues despite the fact that there's a shift to online learning and so on. So the, the social costs of this are enormous, but it's also that as long as this debt puts such a pressure on developing country finances that they cannot spend not just on their own people, but for macroeconomic recovery, you will not get a global recovery. So just as in public health, we now know or should know that nobody is really safe until everyone is because this disease spreads and, and come, takes new forms and comes back at you. Similarly, you're not going to get a global economic recovery until all countries have that fiscal space to actually increase the necessary kinds of spending that will enable the economies to recover and employment and livelihoods to recover. What's going on right now, the big issue in terms of the global architecture is that we don't have a framework to resolve this debt. We don't have a debt resolution that countries routinely provide to their own companies inside the economy. In other words, you know, there are debt resolution frameworks for individuals, for municipalities, corporates within countries. You know, there are legal codes to deal with bankruptcy and to manage it and to reduce debt. We do not have a global sovereign debt mechanism that could reduce or restructure or provide relief and make it a feasible and sustainable debt. As long as you don't have that, you have the ability of both public and private creditors to keep putting the screws on developing countries and make it impossible. And I have only talked about the impact on these economies, but at some point there will be more default. It's inevitable. Mm. At some point there will be many, many countries that will simply say we cannot pay. We do not have the foreign exchange to pay. And then you can easily get domino effects in financial markets. And unfortunately, I fear that that's when you will get the advanced countries sit up and take notice. The point is that once again, the UN uh, committee, there was a, a commission uh, on the global economic architecture way back after the global financial crisis, headed by Joseph Stiglitz, which made very important recommendations about debt resolution. There have been discussions, UNCTAD has come up with a series of, series of proposals, the UN uh, has made a number of proposals. Somehow these are not being taken seriously at the global level. But again, this is one of those things which is waiting to explode. And we are allowing all we are doing, all the debt relief measures or during the pandemic have been moratorium, which basically means you have to pay right now, you can pay later. But all those payments add up so that when the moratorium ends, you're then faced with, you're kicking a can down the road and letting that can get bigger and bigger as it rolls. So that developing countries, when the moratorium ends, will be faced with this enormous debt, which they cannot resolve. So this is one of those areas, yes, of course, ability to raise tax revenues is a critical element of the resolution, but you need to have a restructuring. And since this Germany has been discussed, just last point I'll make, the best example of how to do a debt restructuring is the London Club of 1951, which actually restructured Germany's debt, which wrote off half of Germany's debt and for the rest of it had a wonderful repayment mechanism, which meant, which basically said, you have to repay every year a maximum of 3% of the value of your exports. And it's really this, uh, which is very underquoted, which was a critical reason for Germany's economic miracle thereafter. The fact that they could move on, they could grow out of this, they could move on and actually embark on a major industrialization and export led strategy. This was a critical element. It's, I believe, extremely unfortunate that the Germans do not feel, feel the same generosity, let's say, even when dealing with Greece, which was one of the creditors in the 1951 deal, and that the European Union and the US do not feel that same need to be generous to the rest of the world in dealing with the debt crisis. But this is an example of how to do successful debt restructuring, and I think it's one we should all bear in mind. Indeed, um, Jayati. Um, I want to bring, I do want to bring you in now, Alex, because uh, Evelyn uh, did talk about uh, 
taxes story or obviously in the Anglo-Saxon word, uh, there's a tendency to put the word tax next to the word burden. And um, a lot of the argument for reducing taxation <coughs> on the wealthy and on uh, businesses over the years has been that this is a burden um, on those who would create jobs and create wealth and make our societies more dynamic. Um, and that's obviously in the backdrop um, in these discussions. How can that narrative, in your view, be changed in a way that would be much more favorable to the idea of serious revenue? from corporate and wealthy sources that's a good question and it, you know part of the the founding ethos of the tax justice network was you know although we came out with a set of of policy proposals that in the early 2000s were seen as completely utopian and unrealistic um which you know are now by and large um, part of the global agenda if not yet fully delivered but the idea wasn't to drive just individual policies, it was to change the narrative, to change the weather, because it is that context within which people think about tax and think about fairness that sets all of the decisions, not just whether you deliver public country by country reporting and deliver it well, but whether in future you defend that, whether you continue it, you know, and whether it, you use it to, to discipline profit shifting. So it's the, you know, that bigger context is, is really important. And look, if you look at tax and the language that's used, um, and our, um, our tax cast presenter, Naomi Fowler, has done a lot of work on this. Tax is an area where the language has been heavily politicized, especially in, uh, in English, over the last 50 or 60 years, driven by a set of think tanks and the kind of the, the thinking around them. Things, uh, you know, terms like tax sovereignty has been used. We almost don't challenge it anymore. We're just starting to, again, that's been used to mean this country should be able to do what it wants with its taxes, whatever the damage that does to everyone else. And actually, we're finally now saying, actually, maybe tax sovereignty is what happens when we all cooperate enough that we can actually have effective progressive taxes. We can tax wealth because it's not hidden offshore, because we're, we're exchanging information. We can tax profits because we might have an international system that allows us to do that rather than tolerating or facilitating profit shifting. The narrative underpinning that is, is kind of key. So when we talk about tax burden, you know, an interesting thing there is, or you know, things like Tax Freedom Day, which you know, is another of these tools, they're only ever used to talk about particular things. If you wanted to say which households face the highest burden of taxes, if we think burden is a reasonable word, then in pretty much every country in the world, it is the household group with the lowest incomes because they'll pay a disproportionate share of their income on consumption, which is increasingly taxed very highly. But we only really seem to talk about who's paying income taxes. And when we talk about burden, you know, and that's the high income households who are paying a much lower share of their total income in tax of, of all forms. So that, where this kind of ties up is thinking now, you know, what the, the good piece that can potentially come out of the kind of reinvigoration of the international reform process, even though where it's landing at the minute is deeply unfair, is that narrative shift. How do we take the end of the race to the bottom and make that meaningful? How do we make sure we empower every country to be able to tax progressively corporate incomes and wealth, whether it's offshore or not, and the incomes of the highest income households? It's that level of uh, collaboration and cooperation, but wrapped up within the idea of global uh, equality rather than the rich countries who are the drivers of all of the tax abuse for decades, both through their multinationals and through their dependent territories and, and their own um, acting as tax havens. How do we flip that? So we're making decisions within that international space to the benefit of everyone and starting with the countries that lose out most heavily rather than the ones that have most power. I mean, that's, you know, that's the challenge. There's a week for the G20 and particularly the members who are not OECD members to say, how do we flip this on its head before it is too late for this particular reform? That's interesting what you're saying, Alex, because yesterday when he was making his statement about the decision by the OECD uh, group, uh, the head of the OECD said that tax competition was legitimate. Um, and he was uh, saying the opposite of your point about collaboration, even as he was welcoming the uh, conclusion that had been uh, come to. 
I mean, that's another of these bits of language, you know, talking about tax competition as if it was equivalent to the the economics model of mm. perfect competition between firms, firms which are in an infinite number and are all exactly the same size and make no um, super normal profits. So a situation that doesn't even ever exist for companies and certainly can't exist for countries because countries can't go bust. There aren't an infinite number of them and people live in them, human beings who depend on those companies having the money to pay for public services. You know, the, the whole language of tax competition has been used very deliberately to completely distort the way we think about the role and responsibility of states. And that's, you know, it's exactly a, a kind of a bit of the weather that we have to change mm -hmm if we're ever to get away from fighting little battles toward making those big shifts. Evelyn mentioned uh, some of the states within the European Union who have a less than excellent record in this. And um, she mentioned the one of which I'm a citizen, um, Ireland. And um, it is it is interesting how I think the, the words uh, beggar my neighbor have uh, had an impact in Ireland because over the years it was very much well, we are a country which is entitled to take a nationalistic view of this. Um, but when other people say, no, you're not entitled to a beggar my neighbor approach, that they've had difficulty in responding to that, I think. It's, it's clear Ireland's done very well from its membership of the European Union, and it's used that to a fair extent to, to exploit um, its neighbors. On the other hand, it's worth saying, you know, when you run the numbers, it's not Ireland that comes out as responsible for the biggest revenue losses of its neighbours. It's the Netherlands, mm. which doesn't have nearly the same yep. infamy. And, you know, it's partly the headline rate. Netherlands and Luxembourg have headline rates in the 20s, even though they're giving effective rates sometimes as low as one or two percent. Ireland is that little bit more open about what it's doing. And, you know, it still has an effective rate much lower than 12 and a half, but it's less extreme yeah. in some ways. And it ends up with kind of taking more of the, the, the blame, I guess. OK, look, I'm conscious that we're coming to uh, an, an end and I'm, I'm conscious also that Jayati wants to get in. So let me have a final round from each of you just to say what you want to say before our session finishes about this theme, Jayati. Thank you. This is not closing remarks. I just wanted to add to what Alex said and repeat something I said earlier, which is that complexity is the enemy of tax justice. And Alex just confirmed that about how the effective rate is so much lower in the Netherlands. I mean, I think it was it that tax justice network that coined that term, the Irish double Dutch sandwich, where you could actually pay zero tax if you exploited the rules. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago in the US, there was a lot of discussion about a political report that uh, pointed out that the top 25 billionaires had been paying no taxes over the last four years, no income taxes at all over the last four years, but perfectly legal, just exploiting the existing rules because of their complexity. And every time you go into this kind of deep inequality, the headline rate is really not what matters. It's really the complexity of tax rules, which can only be exploited by the rich, whether they are companies or individuals, because they can hire tax experts to do all that for them, who end up paying virtually no taxes. I mean, George Soros famously said, famously said he paid much less taxes than his secretary, and now we know it's because he was paying next to nothing. Uh, and this, I think, is really one of the things that all of us who would like a more just global tax system have to keep emphasizing, that anything that makes the system more complex, different definitions, different categories, different rules for different rules, et cetera, all of that adds to the injustice of the system, denies citizens their public services because of inadequate fiscal space resulting from this. Thank you, Jati. Now, um, Evelyn, um, if you would like to make your concluding remarks. Yes, uh, complexity is maybe another word or a form of being transparent. Uh, uh, my goal is always to make as much as possible facts and figures transparent and to make them comparable because then citizens understand what's going on. And therefore, we should go on to make comparable the national tax systems and, and, and therefore also to make them easier. It is about, and this is my uh, final sentence because it fits also to the whole title of these talks, 
It's about financing our social welfare system. So taxes are not a laugh pour la, it's about financing this, what makes uh, citizens feel freer because you have financed infrastructure, be it social infrastructure, education, streets, whatever. And insofar, I just can sum up, I love taxes and everybody should uh, and hopefully will uh, uh, help work on all this that we're improving our systems and make them more, more just uh, worldwide. Thanks, everyone. And finally, Alex, um, your last comments. Thanks, Robin. Um, look, I agree very much with that. I love taxes too. Um, our conference next week is around the four R's of tax, revenue and redistribution, which people think of more easily, repricing, so changing the, the price of things that damage the climate or um, public health, like smoking tobacco. And then the fourth R that people often forget, representation. When we pay tax, we are more likely to hold our government to account. And over time, governments that are more reliant on tax than other forms of revenue are more responsive, are less corrupt. So tax doesn't just give you the money to pay for public services and inclusive states. It makes the state more likely to do the things that citizens want it to do. It is the, the glue that keeps us together. And corporate income tax is only one part of that, but it's a crucial backstop because if you can transform your income into corporate earnings and not pay tax, the rest of the system falls over. So, you know, people say we spend too much time thinking about multinationals, but actually it's the backstop to everything else. The joy of tax depends on taxing multinationals properly and the rest. Um, and, you know, at least a little bit this week, it feels like we're on, on that road if we can keep calling out the inequality and the injustice of the OECD setting rules that benefit their members only, we might even get to a, a fairer outcome in the end. Well, thank you, everybody. I think the one surprising conclusion from my point of view on this is that we've not only dissected a lot of the issues around the corporate taxation, but we've come to the conclusion that um, we should present them not only in a simple and transparent way, but actually as all about the social contract and about life in a democratic society. And maybe as we try to develop this debate a little further across the world, maybe some of those themes will be key to doing so. So thank you very much, uh, Evelyn Regner, um, Alex Cobham and Jayati Ghosh uh, for your uh, fascinating comments today. And thank you, our audience who've been uh, watching and listening uh, for taking part in this uh, Social Europe uh, talk session on corporate taxation. Thank you very much and goodbye.